So uh, welcome everyone. We're so excited to be here this evening with our STEAM panel to finally discuss the long awaited, much anticipated hepatic pump trial. So I know there's been a lot of buzz in our community in Colon Town, especially in the liver communities about this trial. And we're so excited to have um, especially Dr. Litsky with us tonight. He's going to be the main presenter and he has assembled an amazing team that we're so blessed to have with us this evening. Um, and so we have Dr. Sursek from Sloan Kettering, Dr. D'Angelica from Sloan Kettering, and Dr. Mitel from Emory Winship, uh, Emory Winship as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Litsky. Uh, the way that it will work this evening, we are going to listen to his talk first. Everyone has been muted on purpose. Um, if you do have questions along the way, please put those in the chat. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat along the way, because what we find a lot of times, those get addressed as the talk goes on. Uh, then we will um, open up those questions at the very end of the presentation, and we will uh, go through the questions at that time. Uh, so we do have also a couple of patient experts that are going to speak um, after the panel as well. So we will do the presentation, uh, we will hear from those patients about the importance of the trial, and then we will get to the questions that are in chat. So um, Julie and I are running this. So if you, if you have any questions, you can send a private chat to Julie Clower or to me, Betsy Post, and we will help you privately through the chat. And with that, I'm going to turn it over you, to you, Dr. Litsky, and thank you so much for doing this. Um, thank you, Betsy. Um for the kind introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Lidsky. I'm a surgical oncologist from Duke. And as Betsy mentioned, uh, I'm the um, study chair for the upcoming pump trial. It's not quite activated yet nationally. It'll be uh, coming soon and we'll be sure to, to let you all know uh, when it is open for enrollment. Um, but we wanted to talk to you in advance of it opening um, and specifically about this trial that's a randomized study for patients with unresectable liver metastases from colorectal cancer. I'm joined tonight by study co-chairs, Dr. D'Angelica from Amoro Sun Kettering, also a surgical oncologist, Dr. Sursik, who many of you know, a medical oncologist from Sloan Kettering as well, and Dr. Mythel, a surgical oncologist from Emory. Um, Betsy, um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to this incredible group of patients, caregivers, and advocates about this important trial and specifically the nuts and bolts of this trial as they pertain to what um, patients need to know. This presentation is fairly brief, so we want to leave plenty of time for discussion and questions. So over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to briefly review what HAI is and share with you some of the relevant literature supporting its use specifically for unresectable colorectal liver metastases. I'll point out what's missing from the literature and discuss why we believe that this trial is necessary. That trial, which is going to be run through ECOG Akron, has been assigned the, the name EA2222. Um, it's also called the PUMP trial, and I'll share with you the important components of the study design. HAI, now given with concurrent systemic therapy, is a therapy that began over 40 years ago and has since been pioneered and optimized by the group at Memorial Sun Kettering. And it's simply the physiologic and pharmacologic isolation of the liver. And I'll, I'll share with you why. Liver tumors get their blood supply from the artery that goes to the liver, while normal liver, meaning liver that doesn't have tumor in it, gets blood supply from two sources, the same artery that goes to the tumors but also the portal vein, which is the main vein that drains the GI tract um, to, the, to the liver. HAI takes advantage of this inherent physiology and by using a chemotherapeutic drug called FUDR, which has the ideal properties of a short half-life and a near complete hepatic clearance, which means that the drug is essentially completely cleared by the liver and it doesn't leak into the rest of the body we can deliver high dose chemotherapy directly to the tumors without additional systemic toxicity. Now there are a number of indications and disease scenarios where HAI may be considered, but tonight we're going to focus on HAI as it pertains to this trial, to EA2222, which is for a very specific population of patients with liver confined metastatic colorectal cancer to the liver um, that is not amenable to surgical removal after three to six months of chemotherapy. 
I'm going to share with you the limited data that's available supporting its use for unresectable colorectal liver metastases, and I'm going to highlight some of the strengths and weaknesses of these studies. You will notice that none of the data pertains specifically to the EA2222 population. This landmark paper published in 2006 was a randomized trial and was the most recent randomized trial comparing HAI with FUDR alone versus 5-FU alone in untreated patients. I wanna emphasize a couple points. This trial was pump by itself versus systemic 5-fluorouracil by itself, both now considered to be outdated regimens by today's standards. This was also a trial for patients who had never seen any anti-cancer therapy. And while it was a multi-center trial, more than 90% of these patients were treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering. The response rates in this study were doubled with HAI from 24 to 47%. On the left is the hepatic progression-free survival, which is the time from the uh, beginning of treatment to when the disease in the liver gets worse. And you can see that it was improved by two and a half months. On the right, at two years, the percentage of patients who were alive at two years was improved from 35 to 51% in the HAI group. Now, this is a more contemporary trial and is the, more re the most recent prospective study. This is a phase two non-randomized single arm study from Memorial Sloan Kettering with 49 patients who had a pretty high disease burden with uh, a median of 14 tumors, and they were also heavily pretreated. Two thirds of the patients had already seen two to three lines of chemotherapy. These patients were treated with HAI combined with chemotherapy, and the purpose of this study was to determine conversion rates uh, in patients treated with this modality. The response rate, which is the percent of patients who had their tumors shrink by at least 30%, was 86% in patients who had never seen any therapy and 67% in patients who were previously treated with chemotherapy. The overall survival shown by the green line for every patient who participated in this study was 46 months. Um, but in patients who were previously treated, the survival was 30 months. And this was similar irrespective of molecular profiles. Importantly, half the patients converted to resection, which yielded a five-year survival of 63% shown by the dashed line. And this is um, obviously much better than the patients who were on the solid line. These are patients who did not get to resection. Importantly, 14% of patients in this study remain free of disease. And while some of them have required additional procedures for recurrence, they are all cancer-free to date. So in the context of these limited data, I want to take a minute to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of HAI. We'll start with the advantages on the left. As uh, I tried to make clear, um, HAI does allow for the delivery of high-dose chemotherapy directly to the liver where the tumors reside. It's also associated with high response rates, even in patients who have been treated with chemotherapy before. It's associated with high conversion rates, meaning patients who were initially unresectable have their tumors shrink in a way that facilitates uh, a, an operation. And in patients who, who don't get to surgery, it's been associated with high rates of disease control or essentially disease stability. This last point here, I think, is, is the big question mark. Um, there may be an association with improved survival, but we don't really know, and based on the data I showed you, it's not clear um, whether HAI really is associated with an improvement in survival uh, compared to modern chemotherapy. The disadvantages are shown on the right. Patients treated with HAI require a major operation. You have to have surgery to implant the pump. It also requires that the patient travel to a pump center every two weeks. And for some patients who live in proximity to a pump center, that's not such a big deal. But for patients who live in rural parts of the country or maybe in a state where an HAI center doesn't exist, this can create huge travel burdens. It also requires a significant dose reduction in the systemic component of chemotherapy, about 30%. So if patients have um, undiagnosed or unrecognized cancer outside of their liver, this potentially can result in growth of that cancer 
uh, and affect uh, patients in various ways. Additionally, about one in five patients will have a complication that's unique to HAI. Um, and this is a risk that patients who aren't treated with, with HAI uh, would never have to put themselves at risk for. So now that you know some of the perceived pros and cons of HAI, um, I do want to show you what the current landscape of HAI looks like. Despite the limited data and historically poor outcomes um, 20 or so years ago outside of a few select centers who were doing it uh, at high volume, this graph demonstrates the rapid expansion of HAI over the past five to 10 years. The blue line and left-sided axis corresponds to the number of new centers opening in any given year, and the black arrow and right-sided axis corresponds to the cumulative number of active HAI centers in the United States. Based on this wave of enthusiasm, Mike D'Angelica and I co-founded and co-lead the International HAI Consortium. This consists now of over 150 surgeons and medical oncologists from 66 centers worldwide. And we're committed to designing and implementing multi-center randomized trials with HAI to advance the field. In doing so, we aim to improve HAI outcomes, identify which patients will derive the greatest benefit from HAI, and determine whether HAI should be included or considered in standardized approaches for patients with colorectal liver metastases. Now you might be asking yourself, why do we need a trial? And specifically for patients with unresectable liver confined colorectal liver metastases uh, after three to six months of chemotherapy with the data I showed you that may suggest a benefit and all of these centers now using HAI routinely. Well, for a host of reasons I'm gonna emphasize in just a moment, we think that if there was ever a trial that's justified, it's this one. Now, as I hope I've made clear, the most recent randomized trial is over 15 years old and compared what are now considered to be outdated HAI and systemic therapy regimens. And combined with the fact that the majority of data come from one institution, uh, there is ongoing skepticism in both the oncology and patient communities regarding the safety feasibility, and efficacy of HAI. This therapy is not widely accepted. In fact, it's quite polarizing, and it's performed at less than 1% of hospitals. The majority of HAI is performed at only about 10 of those hospitals, which means that most patients really don't have access to it. Perhaps the most importantly, we do not know how the addition of HAI compares to modern chemotherapy, such as full FOX or full FURY. Is it better? Is it worth the operation, the additional risk that patients take on? We don't know. When HAI is recommended to a patient, it is not based on high level evidence to support it. Now, personally, I believe that HAI is a good therapy, but despite having started the HAI program at Duke five years ago, when I'm sitting in front of a patient in my clinic and I'm trying to figure out what the best therapy for that patient is, I still struggle to know if HAI is going to be a good choice or not. I lean on my training. I lean on what I've been taught. I lean on some good uh, experiences I've had with other patients. But what I don't have is the evidence to back up the recommendation when I give that to a patient. Now, with these realities in combination with this wave of enthusiasm I just showed you, we found ourselves in this window of opportunity. For the first time ever, there are now enough centers using HAI to conduct a real world multi center trial. Our goal is to therefore determine if HAI plays a meaningful role in standardized algorithms for patients with colorectal liver metastases. And regardless of the answer, it will be practice changing. We owe this to you. We owe this to the patients. We owe this to future patients. Now, as a reminder, there are a number of indications for HAI. It's used most commonly for patients with liver metastases from colorectal cancer. It's also used for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, a certain type of liver cancer. But tonight, we're discussing EA2222, which only applies to a specific and somewhat restricted population of patients. On the left, you can see the broad patient eligibility, which I'll expand upon on the next slide. 
So EA2222 is specifically for patients who have unresectable liver confined metastatic colorectal cancer who have seen at least three, but no more than six months of chemotherapy. We're also going to include patients who develop liver tumors within 12 months of completing chemotherapy for earlier stage disease. As you walk from left to right, you can see that patients will be randomized two to one into two different standard of care groups. Both groups include standard of care chemotherapy, and one of the groups includes a pump. We view both of these groups to be standard of care options. You'll notice that there is no crossover. And I also wanna highlight that patients in both arms, regardless of the group that they're assigned to, at the time of progression or worsening disease, it is required that the patients will be discussed at the enrolling institution's multidisciplinary conference to help them select the next best therapy. Some of the expanded criteria are shown here. Patients must have stable or responding liver only metastatic colorectal cancer, but remain technically unresectable after at least three, but no more than six months of chemotherapy. Patients who have known or suspected disease outside of their liver are not eligible for this trial. Patients who can be cleared with um, a staged operation or those who have had prior liver-directed therapy, such as Y90 or chemoembolization, are not eligible. And any patient who has abnormal liver function is also not eligible. Now, as you're digesting some of these details of the trial, I want to thank Julie, Angie, and Betsy, all incredible patient advocates, as you know, and their help for, uh, and, uh, and, and their help for designing this trial. All three were instrumental in helping make sure that this trial remained patient-focused and patient-centric, and that the design remained ethical and appealing to patients. With their support and contributions to the trial design, we were able to convince the cooperative group leadership that this trial will answer an extremely important question for patients and help guide future care. I'll let them speak shortly, but I wanted to make sure that I publicly thank them tonight for all that they do and all that they've done so far and all that they will do for EA2222, as well as all of the patients in this, uh, in this community. So in summary, what do you as patients or patient advocates need to know about HAI and about EA2222? First, HAI is a specialized therapy for patients with unresectable colorectal liver metastases as one single indication, but the data comparing HAI to modern chemotherapy do not exist. We simply don't know if HAI is better than chemotherapy. Therefore, EA2222 has been designed to definitively answer this exact question. Does HAI, when added to chemotherapy, improve outcomes compared to chemotherapy alone? Now you may ask, should patients with unresectable colorectal liver metastases continue to be treated with HAI? Well, I think it depends. Outside of trial eligibility, sure. You can seek the expertise at your local center and determine if it's right. But for patients who fall within the narrow window of having been treated with three to six months of chemotherapy, yet remain unresectable, which is the exact population of patients eligible for EA2222, I think that answer depends ultimately on what the outcome of this trial is. Now, the outcome of this trial, especially if positive, will help make HAI more accessible in the future, not just through increased referrals by some providers who are currently skeptical and could be swayed by the results of the trial, but importantly, through increased training and expansion of this therapy to more centers throughout the country and throughout the world. So our request is that patients seek evaluation at their local HAI center to determine first the appropriateness of HAI, but also whether they're eligible for the trial. Thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to the discussion. So, Julie, I think that you are going to give some comments, um, just your feedback as a stage four liver METS patient. Yeah. Yeah. So I so I want to just say a couple things from two perspectives. One is me as a patient, um, you know, with this with this trial because it's very um, 
uh, specific to me because I was faced with this question, this exact question um, of whether to get the pump or not um, early in my treatment. And then secondly, as you know, a patient advocate and, and kind of from a clinical trial perspective. Um, so from a patient perspective, I was faced with this choice five years ago or over, over five years ago now, yay. Um, I was unresectable. I, you know, it started chemo. The question was, um, whether I should do the pump or not. And I, you know, heard very compelling stories, obviously in Colon Town, lots of people who had great stories of how the pump saved their lives. Um, and oncologists who said to look into it. And at the time, so it was, it was, it was a tough choice, but at the time I looked at it and I said, but the data doesn't really support that it's actually a better choice. And so the data that, that Dr. Litsky um, shared here, I looked at it and I just said, I don't know, there's questions and there was too many questions about other things related to my um, treatment that I decided not to do it. So um, at the time, having data from this trial really made a difference, but um, I decided not to have it. I had chemo, you know, the standard treatment, just 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 as you um, saw in the in the um, second arm of this trial. Um, I had a PVE, had a resection, a major, you know, seventy percent of my liver resected. I had two fast recurrences, um, which were treated very quickly and easily, and my liver has been disease free for over four years. So, um, for me, when I look back, I think. I made the good, the right decision for me, you know, because here I am sitting here with, with um, a success story um, of not having gotten the pump. And I would tell you that not getting the pump is probably why I'm alive today for various um, reasons, um, subsequent reasons. Um, and then there's patients who would say that they're alive today because of the pump. And the reality is it doesn't matter if that's what I think about my case. And that doesn't matter what that, that patient thinks about their case, um, because we don't know. We don't know if I had gotten the pump, would I be still be sitting here? And if that person hadn't gotten the pump, would they still be sitting here? We have no idea. We can't do that. We can't have one patient do two, do two treatments. But what we can do is do a randomized trial, which means it's two similar patient sets. So it's not the same patient, but it's a group of patients and it's sized to make sure that they're comparable where you can compare across those two patient sets. So this is as close as you can get to having, you know, me having done both and seeing what happens. So I think it's, you know, really important to be able to have that, um, to have that data. So when there's people like me that are sitting there trying to decide what to do, um, you have that data and you aren't just going with emotion and gut and, you know, the best that you can guess, because as a patient, those are the toughest decisions. As everybody here knows, how many times have we had to make those decisions where you say, you know, I'm leaning into something and I'm hoping it works. Um, there's good reasons why it might work. There's good reasons why this other choice might work. And I don't know which one's better. So what a gift to actually have that data that, that, that tells us which one is better for patients like you. Um, so that's from a patient standpoint. Um, from a from a clinical trial standpoint, um, the the kind of exciting thing I think about this trial, and I mean, there's various things I think that are interesting about it, but is that it's two really good options. So usually in trials, um, you're kind of comparing, you know, something that might be known to something that's unknown, or something, you know, there's there's it's very hard to get a, a match set of, of options that are both very good. And so to have a trial where both arms you're getting a good treatment option on both arms is pretty exciting, um, I think, from a from a clinical um, trial design perspective. Um, and I love um, the fact that patients are going to have access to the tumor board. I mean, having those smart minds on your case, regardless of if you're in either way, just having those people thinking with you on um, kind of best alternative for your next treatment, um, how powerful that is. So. Thank you for the work on this. I think it's called EA2222 because that's how many months it's taken you to get this trial <laughs> to happen. Um, so um, thank you for your perseverance, both the um, Dr. Angelica, the Angelica and everybody who's been working on the pump for years and years and years and years to get to this point. Um, um, and then also for the team that actually put the put this trial together because it's it's they're not easy to to get through the system. And so the fact that you're this close is exciting. So congratulations to you. Uh, thank you, Julie, for for sharing your story. Um, your your courage uh, and vulnerability are inspiring, yeah. and um, can't thank you enough for all the help you've been to us. Um, I, I think you you said it perfectly. Um, you were treated um, successfully without a pump and had a great outcome, and um, I think that's important because, um, as you mentioned, the two different treatment groups in this trial 
are both standard of care. They're not considered experimental. They're both standard of care. They're both good options. Um, and it's important. Uh, we have patients that do well without pumps all the time. Um, so thank you for sharing your story. Um, there was one question, uh, I guess, uh, just to define what it means to be unresectable. Um, maybe that would help to clear that up. Um, and then Betsy, I'll let you take back over with questions. Okay. Um, uh, unresectable just means that the, the tumors in the liver cannot be safely removed. And there are different, different reasons for that. Sometimes it's based on a location of a tumor near a structure that can't be, can't be injured or can't be removed with it. Sometimes it's based on the number of tumors um, where we just can't technically remove uh, so many. So there are different factors, but unresectable is just another word uh, for um, tumors that cannot be safely removed. Thank you. And um, we're going to get to the questions in just a second, but I wanted to um, let Angie, uh, who is our other a caregiver that did help um, with the trial design, who's also a doctor, which I think is very important. Her husband was the patient. I, I would like to get Angie's feedback and the questions are still coming in and then I am going to go to the questions. Thanks, Betsy. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about my story. My husband, John, was diagnosed when he was 45 and he was stage four with um, over 10 liver nets and two numerous to count lung nets. Um, he did um, a, go under standard of care for two years, um, at which point he, um, and, and during that time, he actually did have liver resection and he had a fairly good response um, to, um, uh, from chemo to his liver nets. Um, he, after two years, he was in six clinical trials and really um, did uh, very unique trials and um, was never really a candidate for, for the liver pump, but I will tell you that I followed the pump for the entire time that he was treated and after that, um, mainly because uh, as a physician, I am a family physician and still practice as a family physician. Um, I am fascinated by this pump. I think it is really an incredible um, tool and, and especially for the right people. And I was, and as I looked for data when I was investigating, thinking that John would need a liver pump at one point, um, I was really stunned that there really wasn't a lot of data. And um, and then as I asked my husband's oncologist, um, some of the comments were made about um, this pump being voodoo medicine, which I was really in, even more fascinated by. And and as I've spent a lot of time talking with patients that I know that have had pumps. Um, you know, talking and talking and thinking about this trial and being able to give my input to this trial. I just want to be very clear that I do not believe this is leading medicine. Um, the fact that this trial is comparing two standards of care is very important. And um, if you are a patient in which you qualify, I think we're we're looking at um, groundbreaking uh, a groundbreaking study here because not only um, will many patients be able to get the benefit of being enrolled in the trial, um, but there will be allowed for um, uh, crossover in the trial, um, which we can explain in a little bit. And then, um, but also um, most importantly, because it's going to be available across the United States, many, many patients will be eligible to participate in this trial, which I think is really, amazing and I really give everyone a lot of credit for putting this together. Um, my husband John um, ultimately um, died about four years ago from from his uh, cancer but I think many of you are here today because of the clinical trials that you participate in. So for those of you that participate and, uh, and I'll tell you what John said, John participated in clinical trials until the very end because he believed that um, whether that maybe his life wouldn't be saved, but he would be able to save someone else's. And, and I firmly believe that the work that was done um, five and 10 years ago um, is, um, you know, is, is saving the lives of those today. And last thing I want to close with is that I had the opportunity to work with a colleague about four or five years ago, whose mom died of colon cancer. And it turns out that her mom was one of the very first um, pump patients at Sloan Kettering way, way, way back when the pump was just coming out and it was pretty crude. Um, but she's really thrilled. I, I sent her a little message today 
to let her know that I was going to be doing this webinar. And she's thrilled and wishes everybody the best and is really excited that the um, therapy, the novel unique therapy that her mom participated in is still here today and um, getting some new life. So um, look forward to talking with all of you later on. Thank you so much, Angie. And then I think Dr. Litsky had asked if, because um, we've heard a lot from the surgical oncologist perspective, but we do have a Dr. Sursek here who is a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I know that we wanted to get some comments from her and then we will get to the questions. I promise they're amazing. I'm so thankful for all these questions. Um, if, if we could let Dr. Sursek talk from a medical oncology perspective. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, people often when they hear about the pump, they associate it with the surgeons, but obviously as a medical oncologist who trained and has been practicing um, at Sloan Kettering, I've been using the pump quite a bit. I'm very familiar with it, but I'm equal as excited as I think everyone here that we are finally doing a trial where we, we will have the answer where we're comparing the pump with chemotherapy to modern systemic chemotherapy, which I think as everyone has, you know, very nicely outlined has been one of the main criticisms. Um, and so we'll, we'll see if, if really this, there is this added benefit of effectively high dose chemotherapy directly into the liver and does that actually make a difference for our patients, you know, logically, um, um, you know, as Angie just said, you know, some people say it's it's voodoo medicine. It's really not voodoo medicine. It's high dose chemotherapy into the liver. It makes sense. I think where the questions arise is, well, does that even add anything if we're already giving chemotherapy, or does that change anything for our patients? And then a super important question that we still all ask ourselves, and we might learn from this trial is who are actually the patients that really benefit, right? We, we know them, we see them all the time. I see them all the time in Memorial, but how do we actually identify them beforehand to better select? And, and, and we'll learn that because there are definitely people that have liver only or what we call liver dominant where most of the cancer just stays in the liver. And that, those are people that really benefit, but we need to do this study. And you know, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And then the second thing is that I think part of that, this voodoo medicine or this reputation is that, the treatment was historically for many, many years just done at one center, just at Memorial. And that, and that's always a problem because in order to do something, you need to be able to replicate it. You need to be able to have more access. Everyone needs to be able to have access to something if it's really going to work. And so, you know, I can't, I really can't overstate how excited I am at all the centers when, when Dr. Litsky showed that map, you know, I get excited every time to see all those different centers that are doing the pump, that are participating in the study, that are going to learn to do it, not just the surgeons who learn how to put it in, but us medical oncologists to manage it, and then all the other teams, because it really is a team effort. So I think one of the big benefits from this study too will come just from that alone, from you know the expertise that everyone will gain, and then the opportunity of patients really all over the country to be able to have this the access to treatment. Um, so that's, you know, that's just a number, a, a number of issues. I think I, you know, thank Angie and, and Julie for sharing their story and, and both are right. We, we really don't know. We need to do the study. Um, and so super glad that it's happening. And I'll just add to, to Julie's point, the 2222, I've actually never seen a study go through as quickly as this one did. All thanks to Mike Litsky, really, who, you know, it was a phenomenal effort. So it was like 0.22 in uh, in study trials opening, actually. Um, but um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, we will hop to questions. And I think that, um, you know, we have the panel here. So hopefully whoever thinks that they have a great answer to chime in. I'm sure you all have different perspectives. Uh, but the first one is... Um, she says, if there are two general questions, she's wondering, you briefly mentioned the cons and risk of HAI, but not in much detail. Could you elaborate? I've spoken with several other hospitals that do offer the pump. Some have mentioned the lack of repeatability in study results and success. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, I think Allie asked that question. Um, thank you. Um, good to see you tonight. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to start with the second part about repeatability or reproducibility. I, I think, um, it's been mentioned a little bit tonight that 
up until now, the safety of this therapy and also um, the efficacy or how well it works has not been proven outside of Memorial Sun Kettering. The majority of data, and I'm not talking like a little bit more than half, I'm talking about almost all of it comes from Memorial Sun Kettering. And they have built an incredible experience there. And that expansion of HAI that I showed in the last five to, to 10 years is really because people have grad, like myself, have graduated from Sloan Kettering and been inspired to start programs of their own. So at this time, we don't know if HAI works just as well at Duke or Michigan or UCSF as it does in Manhattan. We don't know. And we also don't know if it's as safe. So I think that is really an important part of this trial. We're going to answer that question. Um, the pros and cons, um, we could probably talk um, for a long time about the pros and cons. I think the pros uh, are somewhat based on, um, you know, what makes sense from treating cancer. If you treat cancer more aggressively, you would expect a better outcome. But that's actually not always the case. Um, and we've seen that in other, other types of trials uh, and even in trials for, for colorectal cancer. Um, but a lot of those perceived advantages I shared with you, I put in quotations because they're not based on level one or, or you know, level one data, which is randomized trials. They're based on institutional series. They're based on um, retrospective data where people have gone back and looked at their experience. So that level of evidence is just not as strong. Um, the disadvantages are, I guess, similarly flawed because they're also based on these single institutional series and retrospective data. So, um, you know, for the really for the first time since the 70s, when this therapy began, um, we are finally at a point where we can study this therapy, whether it's safe, can it be delivered? Does it work um, more broadly than a single center? And I think we'll answer a lot of those questions about advantages and disadvantages and who benefits from the um, data that we acquire during the course of this trial. Thank you. I am going to ask the next question. Um, and I'm some of the questions I'll edit a little because I really want to keep this about the trial. And then if you do have a question that's not about the trial, but it's about liver mats or the pump generally, please message me. So I'm, I, I don't want to ignore those, but I really want to keep this about the trial. So I'm going to kind of abbreviate this question a little. Um, so if a patient had a single lesion in the omentum that was dead and resected, how long would they need to show um, that there was no additional peritoneal lesions if they could be eligible or would they at all ever be eligible for the study? That's a great question. Um, this trial excludes patients who have known disease outside of their liver. So um, while HAI may be considered in that scenario, we make we do make exceptions. I think historically um, the ideal population to treat with HAI has disease only in their liver. And we really try to stick with that. We do make occasional exceptions. But for trial purposes, for EA2222, a patient with, with that history would not be considered eligible and could consider being evaluated at a local HAI center on whether or not that therapy is appropriate off trial. Great. Uh, so Dr. Litsky mentioned three to six months of systemic chemotherapy as an eligibility criteria. If patients have not had three to six months of chemotherapy, but otherwise qualify for the trial, can they choose to get the pump without participating in the trial? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I want to first um, mention why we came up with this three to six month uh, duration of chemotherapy. And because uh, I, I think that will answer a little bit of um, a little bit of the rationale. So patients who start on first line chemotherapy most commonly will have oxaliplatin uh, included in that regimen whether it's full fox or full fox Erie, I'm sure those are regimens familiar to most people um, here tonight. Um, 
the majority of patients who receive that drug will eventually develop dose limiting neurologic toxicity, typically in the form of numbness or tingling in their hands and feet. They get neuropathy. And it typically happens sometime between three and six months. So we chose this window um, where it also fits where patients would typically derive the greatest benefit from that first line therapy also within that first three to six months. And also the time where they may reach the end of that therapy and be faced with a decision. Is their oncologist going to switch them to maintenance chemotherapy? Is their, is their oncologist going to switch them to second line therapy? That's kind of the decision tree. And the third option would be whether or not to add a pump. And so that's how we came up with this three to six months. As I mentioned, the trial is for a very specific and pretty restricted patient population. So if you're a patient and you have cancer in your liver that's not amenable to resection or, or to surgical removal, and you haven't had at least three, but no more than six months of chemotherapy, then you're not eligible for the trial. So in theory, HAI can be used in patients who have less chemotherapy and anybody who's exceeded six months of chemotherapy would be eligible for consideration of a pump off the trial. Great, thank you for making this so clear. This is very helpful. Um, I think we already answered this other one, uh, basically because it's about peritoneal METs. So if they had high PEC first, then perhaps HAI, and you, I think, made it clear that they could seek an opinion off trial, but they would not be eligible for the trial. Correct. Um, let's see. Is FUDR the sole chemo drug that will be, um, sorry, that will be offered through this trial? If so, how is this different from the trial at NIH? Um, I'm not sure exactly which trial at the NIH, um, this question is referring to, um, currently the, the cornerstone of HAI is FUDR. Um, it's not a new drug. It's, it's the drug that's been used, um, for decades. And it's really the only drug that we have, uh, at least some data, uh, regarding a safety profile and an effectiveness profile. So it is the only drug that will be used in the pump, um, but it will be combined with standard of care chemotherapy. So as a reminder, if you're assigned to the HAI group, you will receive HAI in addition to the chemotherapy that your oncologist feels is most appropriate. Great. Uh, da, 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 da. I have to just scroll down. How long will the trial last? Um, the trial, uh, as a, it, again, it's not open yet. I think I saw a question about a patient who was treated at Duke, uh, and got a pump, uh, recently. The trial is not, not open yet. Um, so it's anticipated to open sometime this fall. I will be sure to let Betsy know. She will be sure to let Colin Town, um, know. The trial is expected to last, uh, or to enroll, uh, about five and a half years. Um, and then the follow-up is, is, is a little bit longer. Great. And uh, chemotherapy for more than a year will render the patient ineligible. That's a question. Chemotherapy for more than six months renders the patient ineligible for the trial, but not necessarily ineligible for HAI as standard of care off trial. Great. I, want, I want to make that very clear. This is for a, win a narrow window of, uh, of uh, a narrow population of patients. So just because the trial is open, if you're not within that eligibility criteria, HAI still may be a perfectly good therapy for you. Um, and I encourage you to seek evaluation at your local center to determine if it is. Um, but that would exclude, exclude uh, a patient like that from the trial specifically. Okay. My computer keeps skipping around as all the questions come in. So I'm trying to focus. <laughs> uh, let's see. The ETA for the trial is December, 2023. Does that schedule still sound reasonable? I hope we're actually um, 
open sooner than that. We, we've been running ahead of schedule. Um, we're in the final stages in preparation of activating nationally. And then each individual center will need to open the trial um, at their own center. So sometime this fall, the trial should be open to, to enrollment. Um, and then it'll take some time before all of the yeah. centers participating are, are also open. Um, it can be difficult to recruit patients for randomized trials. Could you speak to that? Um, you're right. Um, <laughs> it is it is hard. Um, you know, as much work that's gone into to this trial so far to get it through the the cooperative groups, um, we we talk amongst the study team that what we what's been done so far is actually easy, and the hard work starts now. Um, recruiting patients to, to randomize trials is very difficult. Um, there are patients who don't want to be randomized. And, and I think we all understand that. Um, I think the important things that we will focus on as providers is that um, the trial is comparing two perfectly good standard options, as far as we know. Um, we don't know that one is better than the other. Um, we as providers have, have equipoise, meaning that, um, ethically we are, we are conducting this trial because we don't know the answer already. Um, and, um, you know, as we talk to patients, we'll have to, we'll have to have these transparent conversations with them. But, but I, I think we all agree recruiting to a randomized trial will be a challenge. Um, I think platforms like this where patients can, talk to each other um, will be important. Um, and of course, um, not every patient will want to participate and, and that's okay. Thank you. Uh, this next one is um, typically from what I've seen, clinical trials are testing new drugs or new drug combinations. HAI has been around for approximately half a century and is not experimental. My computer keeps skipping around. I'm sorry. Since this trial is being done at many, um, at the majority of HAI centers and the pump will not be available at any of them outside of the trial for this patient population, it seems like withholding potentially life-saving treatment from the patients who know they want the pump but won't be able to get it if they are randomized to the systemic only arm. I personally know many patients who will likely, who would likely not have survived Without the pump, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I'll, I'll make a comment and then maybe I'll ask uh, one of the other um, study team members to, to similarly comment so you don't all get tired of hearing my voice. Um, this is a really, really good question. And this is something that we have been discussing amongst the consortium since the very beginning. This is a, a question that's come up as we designed the trial and, and had frequent meetings with Julie and Angie and Betsy. Um, I guess one way to look at this is that, you know, the pump may be life-saving for some, it's not life-saving for all. And Julie's story is actually um, a testimonial that you can achieve a great outcome without it. She um, decided not to be treated with HAI, and here she is years later with a great outcome. So I don't think that HAI is a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet for this disease. And I feel very strongly that being assigned to the control arm or the, the chemotherapy only arm is similarly not a death sentence. All right. Julie is a Julie is an example of that, the story she shared. So um, I think I don't know what else to say beyond beyond that. Um, I'll turn it over to one of the, the, the team members. Uh, but this is a really, really great question that we've all been discussing and pondering um, for many, many months. I can comment, Mike. Um, 
you know, this is a therapy that we've been studying for decades. And uh, obviously, we have our own internal biases. But I, I would agree with Mike. Julie's story hits it right, the nail right on the head. Um, there's no question we've helped plenty of people with pump chemotherapy. And there's no question people have had out great outcomes without it. Um, and what we have learned in medicine is that even though what may work for me as a, as a physician who does this is it may not work for everybody and it may not work in every center. And, uh, for 20 years, I've listened to people tell me it never works outside of the Upper East Side of Manhattan, um, which, you know, we could talk about that for a long time, but it's about time we, we really test whether that's, that is true or not. Um, we all struggle with this question. Most of us really think this is a great therapy, but we're all academics and we want to find the truth. And this is what we have to do. And this is the only way there are countless examples of things that look great in a single center or look great in one trial. And then you subject them to a randomized trial. and They're not as good as you think they are. And we don't know that's made. That's one possible outcome here. It may also be a great outcome that it is incredibly beneficial and it can be done outside of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, and this will be an amazing finding as well, but we have to be committed to finding the truth. And I think actually I would defer to how Julie said it. I thought she said it just perfectly and, and we're a hundred percent in line with that. Yeah, I would echo that completely. You know, as a medical oncologist, we, we, we would not do a study without equal voice where we felt that, one group is going to do better and we're compromising the other group, but we don't know we need to do it. Um, and we all feel very strongly about that. And as I said, you know, the a lot of the enthusiasm is that this will now be, and super important now be outside of, of MSK. Um, and so we'll learn not only about whether it works or not, but how well it works and how well we can handle everything that goes along with the pump, including potentially the, the toxicity. So, um, it's a super, super important question. And, and I'm, you know, I'm very glad it was asked. And I, uh, I hope our answer is clear, because it is really important to, to know that and to feel comfortable that if you're in, if you're not in the pump arm, that we do have good treatment options for you. There are other trials, there's other things that we do as well. And likewise, for the pump arm, and, you know, um, that's just that that's oncology. And so we would not take something away that we felt was certainly for sure going to work, or going to be better. Thank you. Uh, we do have people asking if you could put the slide back on of the trial schema. I think that they maybe want to look at that and maybe ask a question around that. Um, let's see. And can you okay. see it? Yes. Um, what in your mind is responsible for the variability in results that you are expecting between Sloan Kettering and other centers? Is it surgical skill, surgical experience, identifying patients, managing potential issues with the pump? Could you try to explain more? Um, that's a great question. I don't think we're expecting variability in results outside of Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think the point I was trying to make is that the safety of this therapy and the effectiveness of this therapy has never been proven outside of Memorial Stone Kettering. Um, historically, there are a number of centers um, who opened HAI programs, and this is really in the late 90s, early 2000s, and almost all of them shut down. And, you know, there are many reasons for this, and, uh, you know, we can hypothesize. I think um, one of those reasons is lack of expertise. There's no substitute for experience. One of those um, reasons is that's also the same time that full Fox and full Fury became common regimens. Um, oxaliplatin and arinotecan were new drugs. And I think new programs were seeing a lot of toxicity, a lot of side effects, and, and not a lot of perceived benefit all at the same time that these new drugs were coming out and it was easy to abandon HAI. So again, I don't think we're expecting to see uh, different outcomes uh, across the country uh, compared to Sloan Kettering, um, but it is possible, not expecting it, but it's possible. So what we hope to see is that this therapy is safe 
number one, that it's safe. And then number two, we want to answer the question is, does it work more broadly than at a single institution? I don't think it's related to surgeon experience. I do think there is an element of oncologist experience that can be overcome with training. Um, the hard part of HAI is the delivery of, of the pump chemotherapy safely. Um, and, and that's, um, I didn't comment on this, but to be eligible as a center to participate in this trial, the pump center itself has to have a minimum experience. They have to have overcome their learning curve. They have to overcome their early phases where they are now considered proficient and able to do this safely. So they have to have a minimum volume that they have taken care of, a minimum number of patients. And they also have to have achieved uh, an acceptable safety profile uh, before they can enroll a patient. So I want to make that clear as well. Thank you. Thank you. Will the pump still be available for unresectable patients that fit the profile to use outside of the trial? Um, another really good question. Um, for this very narrow patient population, um, the I guess the hope is that patients would be willing to to participate in the trial. Of course, we can't force people to participate in a trial and we can't restrict therapy. So um, I think I think it all depends on the center um, that you're seeking evaluation at and whether you are truly eligible. Will all centers in the HAI consortium be participating in the trial? Um, ideally, yes. But as I mentioned, we have a minimum um, experience required. So some of those centers I showed you on the on the slide with all the different institutional logos, some of those centers are new uh, and they haven't met their minimum experience required to participate. But if they do meet that requirement while the study is open, then they can enroll patients. Um, are BRAF V600 patients eligible for the trial? That's another great question. Um, BRAF mutated patients are eligible. Um, it's a relatively small population, but they would be eligible to participate. The molecular profile um, that is not eligible are the MSI high patients or the microsatellite unstable patients. Um, we don't have too many left. Let's see. Could you please go over what a successful trial would be in terms of results? On the other hand, if the trial wasn't successful, what would that look like? Well, the purpose of this study is to determine if HAI added to chemotherapy improves overall survival. There are, there are many different endpoints that trials can study. Uh, Progression-free survival, response rates, um, but the one endpoint that makes the biggest difference uh, for patients who are taking on a therapy with risk is what they, they want to know if it's going to make them live longer, if it's going to help them live longer. So the study has been designed to answer the question about survival and no other endpoints short of that. We will, of course, study those other endpoints about progression and response and conversion to surgery, but the focus is on overall survival. So if this trial is a positive trial, meaning it detects a statistically significant difference in survival between the two groups, then um, it would justify the things that I discussed, such as um, expansion of training, expansion of programs to, throughout other hospitals, um, there are states in this in this country who do not have HAI programs. And there are states, there are people who reside in parts of this country who have multiple states next to them without pump programs. So if the trial is positive, it would justify expansion of that expertise more broadly to improve accessibility for patients. I think, as I mentioned, um, there are, and as Julie mentioned, 
uh, and has been mentioned by other people, um, there are a lot of people, not just in this country, but in the world, who don't believe the data that is published, who don't believe that this therapy works, who think it is voodoo. They're skeptical. They don't think it can be done. Uh, and they don't believe the data. And perhaps if this is a positive trial, some of those skeptics um, would be able to, to change their mind. Right now, they're skeptical because we don't have good data. But with good data, maybe we can we can change their mind. If it's a negative trial, meaning that there isn't a statistically significant difference in survival, I think we'll have to look at why that outcome was achieved. Um, it is it is possible that that'll be the case, and maybe this narrow population of patients isn't the ideal population to put pumps in. It's also possible that we'll be able to detect subpopulations of patients who have had three to six months of chemotherapy who derive significant benefit compared to others who do not. Um, I think on the schema you saw that we're we're going to um, stratify or distribute patients to the two groups based on the location of their tumor, their primary tumor, and also their molecular profile. Those are two things that we think have important implications in how aggressive the cancer may be. And it's possible that HAI works better in one of those groups versus others. Thank you. I think we just have a few more questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I think this one's quick. <laughs> I am assuming the pump will still be available for patients who are getting the pump for adjuvant chemo or that do not meet eligibility criteria for the trial, such as greater than 70% liver involvement or extrahepatic disease. 100%. This, this trial does not mean that the only people getting pumps will be on, on trial. There are, as I mentioned, many other indications, adjuvant therapy, um, patients who have had significant amounts of chemotherapy and who become intolerant or uh, to it, or or it's no longer working. Um, there, there are uh, you know a number of different scenarios. Uh, even a patient, there was a question about a single lung metastasis. That patient is not eligible for the trial, but that patient could get a pump off trial. Um, so I do think there. This does not mean that HI is is is, is temporarily on halt. It'll still be used just as it's always been used for patients who are outside of trial eligibility. Right. Is the trial only in the U.S. or also in Canada? Um, Shisher, I, I'm pretty sure it can open in Canada, correct? Yes, yes, it can. The The Canadian network is part of the NCI, so they yeah. can open it as long as, yeah. Yeah, there is only one center um, in Canada that does HII, that's Sunnybrook in Toronto, um, but they are planning, as far as I know, to, to be a participant. Do any specific mutations exclude a patient from the trial? Um, no. Um, we, we will, as mentioned earlier, um, will include patients with BRAF mutations, KRAS mutations, as long as they fit the other criteria of having disease confined to their liver and be technically unresectable, then those patients are eligible. The only patients who are not eligible are the MSI high patients because we treat those preferably with immunotherapy. Great. Um, let's see, gosh, my computer keeps skipping around, I'm sorry. Does the trial cover travel expenses and such? That would be worth mentioning if so. That's a good question, it does not. Um, these, um, these, uh, treatment groups are both considered standard of care. Um, they should not incur a cost to the patient for the therapy. Um, the therapy in both groups will be, um, I guess, in a sense, billed to the patient's insurance company, um, as none of it is experimental, but um, we cannot cover travel expenses. Great. Um, I think this one question, the trial's not open yet. So I think Someone's asking, they finished 12 full Fox infusions. The oncologist wants to start on maintenance chemo. Would that disqualify me? I think maybe because the trial's not open yet. So you may have had too much uh, chemo too, too long before the trial, but probably still eligible for a consultation on a pump off trial. 
I think that's a perfect answer, Betsy. Uh, if the trial were open today, you would be eligible. It is not open, and therefore you can seek evaluation for HAI um, as standard of care off the trial um, or continue with maintenance therapy uh, and seek a pump evaluation later on. Um, do you have a few minutes to talk about crossover at progression? Sure. Um, was there a specific question or do you just want me to talk about it? That was the question. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so the, 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 the trial design does not, um, does not include crossover. Um, and the reason, the reason for that is that, um, when you study an endpoint such as overall survival, um, if patients in one group receive treatment from the other group, the two groups start to look the same, potentially, potentially. And then what happens is um, years of um, patient participation um, and years of treatment have gone into a trial where the answer at the end is blurry and we can't make sense of it. So because we're studying that specific endpoint, crossover is not part of the trial. Um, that being said, we anticipate that very few patients would cross over anyway. Um, and when we decided to pursue this design, um, Julie and Betsy and Angie were a part of that discussion. I assure you, we did not make that decision in isolation. Um, we consulted with Betsy, Julie, and Angie, um, and they felt um, that without crossover, the fact that both groups were still standard of care, the fact that we were going to ensure that patients were discussed at the um, center's multidisciplinary conference uh, at the time of disease progression, uh, that this trial uh, still would remain appealing to patients and would remain ethical, and, and we agreed with them. Thank you so much for your time. There are just a few more, but I think these are so important and they're going to be used in the future for the trial. So I'm going to make uh, FAQs from this. So um, Julie actually has a question. <laughs> Unfortunately, every treatment adds risk. So there are some patients who have had surgical and long-term complications from the pump. Can you talk to the frequency of those? Sure. Um... That slide I showed you with the potential disadvantages indicated that about 20% of patients or one in five will have some sort of HAI specific complication. I would say that the majority of those HAI specific complications are uncommon on their own. Um, the majority of them can be treated um, and um, we can overcome them, but there are some, some things that cannot be overcome. And some of those complications are bleeding complications at the artery, um, injury to the artery. Um, and the one that um, concerns people the most, I would say, is the scarring of the bile ducts. And in this patient population specifically, that risk should be very low. It should be two to three percent, less than five percent um, in general. So it's an uncommon complication, but if it happens, it can be devastating to the patients. And this is exactly why we're requiring centers who participate in this trial to have a minimum expertise. Thank you. Um, there's a question on how many sites do you expect to open and is there any focus on the more rural centers that really don't have this option today? Um, another good question. Um, the majority of centers participating in the consortium um, are academic centers, but there are um, a handful of community-based health systems um, in rural parts of Michigan, Ohio, Florida, for example, um, that will be eligible for the trial and they will participate. Um, as I mentioned, I think experience is important and for trial purposes, um, if a more rural center is able to, to launch a program and acquire the minimum expertise necessary, then they would, of course, uh, be eligible to enroll patients at their center. Um, currently, based on the minimum requirements, there are about 20 centers in the United States that meet eligibility criteria, but there are new centers opening all the time. 
Um, you probably hear about them on Colin Town or see them on Twitter. Um, and um, those centers are are working to acquire their institutional experience. And as soon as they do, they plan to activate and, and enroll patients at their own centers. Thank you. I think there are just two more. Um, I'm a patient of Dr. Kemeny. Given her experience and history of success in treating patients with the pump at Sloan Kettering, will she be involved with the trial or training of medical oncologists on treating with the pump? Um, Andrea, do you want to take that question? If not, I can answer it. Um, I, I It's a great question. So um, Dr. Kemeny, um, has been doing this longer than, than any money out, el anybody else. Um, she has trained countless oncologists to safely and effectively deliver this therapy. Um, Dr. Sersik is one of those people. Um, the medical oncologists at Duke, um, all learned how to do this from her. We, I brought them to Memorial Sloan Kettering for, for a visit and they learned how to do it. Um, I think the important thing now is that Dr. Kemeny has trained so many people and her experience has now uh, branched out to so many different centers that the way people are practicing is the way Dr. Kemeny has trained them. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're, we're carrying out all the optimization that she has been responsible for uh, during her career. Um, I do hope she remains uh, involved in the trial. She's certainly been involved in it thus far. She's been supportive of having a randomized trial for this purpose. Um, she's helped us with the design, the eligibility criteria, and all the other factors that have gone into this. So um, I would expect that she stays involved. Um, but I do want to assure everyone that the expertise that she has gathered, um, she has um, shared with countless medical oncologists who are now safely um, delivering this therapy. Mike, can I can I just add one other thing real quick, Betsy? Yeah, that I just want to reiterate that the model that um, Dr. Litsky just described in terms of the Duke medical oncologist going to Memorial to get trained prior to starting the, um, the program at Duke is not a unique model to Duke. It's it, what pretty much everyone has done. So at Emory, I sent three medical oncologists up as well. So rest assured, everyone is kind of going to the Mecca to get the training. And then the second thing I wanted to say is that the protocols that Dr. Kemeny uses for all the FUDR adjustments and all of that, they're one, they're publicly available, uh, they're online. Two, those are exactly what we've used in the protocols. And we've detailed all of those adjustments based on every single lab value and tried to anticipate every combination and permutation that you would need to be in the protocol so people can follow it. And the third thing is that you know, Dr. Sersek and Luis and all the other medical oncologists at Memorial are also been extraordinarily helpful and willing to take emails and calls from people around the country. So I think there's there's a, a fail safe uh, in multiple ways to make sure that the same standard of care is delivered across the country for all patients enrolled in the trial. Yeah, I'll also make one last comment that pump consortium that I mentioned, we are a very tight knit group. Um, we're all supportive of each other. Um, Many of us trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and for those who didn't, we all work really well together. And the trial that that has become EA2222 was actually designed by the 150 surgeons and medical oncologists in that group. So everybody in the consortium agreed that this is the best population to study, the best um, design to conduct a trial, the best endpoint to look at. Um, and we are all as a group of um, many, many uh, oncologists from surgery and medical oncology eager to, to open this trial, um, enroll patients and, and learn from it. Um, that consortium is also available um, for advice and people in that consortium call other uh, participants all the time um, to ask for advice. And I think that's one of the strengths of this group is no single institution is really functioning independently. We function uh, as, a, as a national and really international consortium. 
Great. And I think there's only one last one that's not answered that can be or that hasn't already been. Um, let's see. Where is it? My phone it bounces around whenever I try. When people add new comments, it bounces. I'm sorry. Uh, will you be collecting information on complications to see if the rates are similar to the Sloan Kettering experience? Thank you for all the great answers and for explaining things very clearly. Um, thank you for this question. Um, yes, we will be collecting a lot of information from every patient who participates in this trial. Um, this includes complications. Um, and, and just to be clear, too, the, the complication uh, data that come from Memorial Sloan Kettering um, are not based on randomized patients. They're based on looking back at their series. So I think it'll be really important even for for Memorial Sloan Kettering to look at complications uh, in, a, in a more uh, rigorous fashion. But things like complications, uh, how many patients uh, are able to undergo an operation after treatment, um, different sites of progression. And then the other thing uh, that we're going to include is patient reported outcomes. And I think this is important for patients. Um, we want to know what the impact is on um, what patients perceive when they when they get treated with either one of these um, therapies, whether it's HAI or chemotherapy alone. How does this affect your your day to day activity, your well being, your outlook? How does it affect your family? How does it how does it affect your your finances and other um, socioeconomic uh, endpoints? For some, getting a pump um, could be, you know, for example physically um, unattractive or disfiguring because there's a, now a bulge um, coming from where the pump sits. For other patients, uh, it could imp impact their, their activities. If they're um, someone who is involved in a certain activity that they need to perhaps uh, dial back, that could be an issue. There are other patients who are gonna make tremendous commitments in terms of travel, which has financial implications. We should learn from that. Um, and it goes beyond the patients too, right? That, that has impact on patients' family members as well. So we intend to learn as much as possible from this trial so that in the future, when we're having conversations with patients, not only are we recommending a therapy that's based on actual evidence, but when they ask the question of, well, what does it mean to have a pump? We can more accurately tell them um, the implications. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's everything. Um, everything that's, I think, relevant to the trial. There are some questions, I think, that are a little bit pump specific. Um, but I guess there is this last one about including pump placement in the trial, meaning, let me look at this one really quick, meaning I have the pump that's not placed in the normal spot. Um, will that also be included different spots that may be handled better on some than others? Um, that's a good question. I think that the location where the pump ultimately um, is implanted is, is uh, somewhat by convention, but often dictated by patient specific factors. So um, we don't dictate in the trial where the pump gets implanted. Um, we leave that at the discretion of the surgeon uh, based on a number of different factors. Okay. All right. Well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Litsky, um, all, and the whole panel for being here tonight, being so generous with your time. Um, I knew we would have a lot of participation and a lot of great questions, and this is really valuable because it's not just tonight. I'm going to, of course, be, you know, we're going to be sharing this, the recording. So as we onboard new patients and caregivers, they'll be able to go back and watch and listen. I'm also going to do an FAQ. Um, from these questions and answers. And of course, I'll send them to you um, and the panel uh, so that you can make sure I captured everything correctly. So this is gonna continue to help patients, um, not just tomorrow, but you know, for a long time to come. So we really, really appreciate all of your, um, all of your help and everything you've done. And I really wanna thank the patients and caregivers that showed up tonight. I think you had great questions um, and I really appreciate all of those as well. So please do continue the conversation in Liver Lovers Lane and HAI Pump People. Um, if you need an ad to those groups, please just message me, Betsy Post on Facebook Messenger uh, to 
join the groups or to ask follow follow up questions for the panel. Um, I'd be happy if there's something that we didn't get to, I can send that question out. We can get an answer for that, hopefully. Uh, but please join us and join in the conversation. Um, and that's all I have. And we will post the recording in Colentown University and in the liver specific groups in Colentown. So thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. This was um, a great way to spend an evening. Um, thank you all the patients, caregivers, advocates. Um, what you do is really important. And uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. I think, uh, Betsy, you know how to get a hold of me if there are questions that need to be answered um, offline. Uh, I'm happy to be available for those. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out.